Jim, it's great to have you. Ian, great to see you as well. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you did do a really phenomenal um, job it's great. It's great. Yeah, on this whole thing. So um, one of the things that we were listening to this week, because we talked to you when this came down, you only had like one or two sections done, you were talking about the cost issues. That, mm. that, that We kept talking about the escalating costs, which Mr. Carasio is going to tell us all about in just a second. But few people kind of were talking about the big dig as a you know marvel of engineering Instead, of, but they were talking about the money. Right. So, went from what was it two billion to fifteen billion, something like if that. If you look at the earliest, earliest estimates of the cost, yeah, it was in the two billion range. Mm -hmm. That was before a lot of things, including inflation, and it ends up, yeah, closer to fifteen. So, yeah. can you? This is almost impossible. I can't believe I'm even going to do this. Give us like a sixty-second uh, trip through memory lane about how the cost thing, and then we'll get uh, Jim Carasiotis involved. Wow, okay, so you're asking for $14 billion yeah. delta <laughs> in 60 change seconds. in 60 seconds. You've used up eight seconds already, okay. so go ahead. A big piece of it is the project just got bigger. We were doing more things. The scope expanded. Second big thing, inflation. That early estimate did not include inflation through the end of the project. And then I think the third thing is that some stuff was just more difficult, more expensive than That originally understood. Than originally understood. So, Jim... Uh, you go by, I believe, James, I made the effing numbers up, Carasiotis. Is that correct? <laughs> I do. You do say that in the, the uh, uh, podcast, I made the effing numbers up. No. I, I, yes, what, you do. What I said was yeah. that a group of people came in, yeah. and when we did the Charles River Crossing, yeah. um, I picked the design. Yeah. I said, how much is this going to cost? Yeah. They said, it'll be $300 million more. And I said, you guys have rocks in your head. Mm -hmm. It's going to, you know, I, I, I'll tell you what. I know nothing about bridge design, but I'm going to give you a billion on top of that, 1.3 billion. It was the last chance that we had to meaningfully adjust the budget, the budget for the project. And so I gave them 1.3 billion total, and they, they all saluted and said, great, thank you very much. We, you know, I said, don't come back. And you know, God love Bechtel. They came back in 12 weeks, and, and they decided to uncouple all of the, the projects or contracts that were supposed to be done in concurrence, and they wanted to do them consecutively, which would have kept them here for eight more years, and so on and so forth, and the prices started to go up. And Bechtel was the legendary private sector company yeah. that done a lot of huge things around the know, country. The Hoover Dam, I don't know, they did the now, Hoover Dam. Excuse me a second, Ian, are you yeah. in charge of this podcast or not? Um, yes, you are. Okay. Did Depends uh, what Mr. You're about to ask. Did Mr. say I made the effing numbers up? <laughs> I think I heard that. Didn't he say that? I, I, I believe that is a direct quote. There is some context, but yes. Made the number up about the bridge. Oh, about the okay. bridge. About the well, bridge. I'm sorry. I okay. added money to the, to the project budget. I gave them money, and I said, don't come back. I'm just and trying to said, aggravate yeah, you. Am I succeeding course. or they said, not? They said they won't come oh, back. So. Okay. Well, one of the great things about but this podcast did. is all the history of the different governors, you know, yeah. King and Dukakis and Weld and Salucci and uh, on down the line. Um, and there's also some great political stories, including this story about one of your nicknames, I guess. Everybody called you Hatchet Man. So that was a great story. How did you come to be called Jim Carasiotis, the hatchet man. Um, Laura Brown from the Herald wrote a piece in December of 1990 that said that the hatchet man is going to come back to government. And <laughs> during the early 1980s, when I worked for Ed King, um, I was an undersecretary of transportation. I was sent to the DPW when post two and a half, there was a state budget that basically made the cities and towns whole so that they, you know, the state picked up the tab for two and a half. So we had to lay people off at the State Department of Public Works. They didn't want to do it. I went down there and I had to force them to do it. And, and you know, I, I said to Ian at the time, I said, there was a chief engineer who said to me, you don't understand, young man. The orchestra leaders come and go, but the band always stays the same. And I said, Whoa. You, you don't understand. <laughs> um, so basically, you know, I removed the leadership of the DPW, made the cuts. So fast forward 1990, Laura Brown writes an article, Hatchet Man's coming back. Um, somebody who I was working with in the private sector gave me a hatchet. I got all kinds of gifts, so I, I came in and it was in a box. And so Can I just add something. my favorite detail from the story is yeah. one of the other gag gifts was a Saddam Hussein Same. style beret. <laughs> Yeah, but that what did, did you not end up in the, in the Department of Transportation. What did you do with the hatchet? So what happened was is that the individual gave it to me. Yes. Um, 30 year old guy had a heart attack and died. He was running across the um, the uh, Mass Avenue Bridge, and it was a hot night, and and he passed out. He died. So I chose to honor him by mounting that plaque, and 
you know, putting it up on my wall. And I, I took a lot of garbage for it, but that was... That so was everybody funny. that came into the office of the Hatchet Man saw the hatchet on the wall in like, like a plaque form and thought, oh my God, my days could be numbered <laughs> yeah, here. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 you know, obviously it was, you know, it was a good narrative. It was a good, you know, um, so, you know, there were uh, any number of stories that ran that, that about the hatchet and, and my activities. And you know, as I said during the podcast, we, you know, we had work to do and we needed to get about the work and there were holdovers who were there and the place was a little fat, so we needed to make some changes and we did. Well, we should put this in context too. 1990, that was when Jim Brady first became famous in Massachusetts for trying to raise everybody's taxes. No, it was and, not. I was trying to stop a tax cut. He prevailed. He didn't want blood in the streets and the children to go hungry and he raised everybody's taxes back in 1990, but conversely... And you know who was elected governor on Bill the same Wells. day that happened? Bill, Bill Wells was yes. elected governor and I think a lot of people were surprised by that because he was kind of the dark horse coming in, but he did prevail. He never expected to win. No, he never yeah. expected to win. And he, I remember seeing him at the, at the Rotary down the Cape when, uh, like during the, right before the primary, standing all by himself with a placard, you know, and people were driving around. They were stuck in traffic, and they weren't even tooting at poor Bill Well, Wells. no one even thought he was going to beat Steve Pierce in exactly. the primary, it was a much primary. less the final. Can we get to stay on money for a second? We, are, we spend a huge amount of this time uh, on the show talking about transparency or lack of transparency in government. And as we all know, we learned in the Boston Globe, we are the only state in America, which is not directly related to what you do, Ian, uh, that uh, has a... Uh, uh, where people in judicial, all three branches of government, judiciary, legislature, and executive, are believed that they are not subject to public record laws. Mm. So let's talk transparency. I mean, one of the things that's pretty, well, let me play a little sound and we'll get to it. Here's Tom Palmer, who obviously used to be at the Globe, transportation guy, recounting when he was called to the transportation building to learn about cost overruns from the project manager at the time, Pat Moynihan, who initially, this is a great story too, who initially said the cost increase would be about a billion dollars. Here's Palmer. And we all, you know, were scribbling and getting ready to race back to our desks and write this. And Pat Moynihan turned around and came back and said, oh, hell, make it 1.5. <laughs> I mean, it was that, like, we're going to have to admit to that someday anyway, so let's do it now. The final number was actually 1.4, but you get the idea. What's a couple hundred million dollars in a project this big? So if, if everybody had been straight all mm. along, whether from the Bechtels to the whoever's, yeah. what difference would that have made in a community that pretty much was tax and government spending averse yeah. unless they believed it directly benefited them? Right. To me, the paradox of the big dig is that if we had known from the very beginning how expensive it would be, how long it would take, how disruptive it would be, and Jim, I'd be curious We're to hear your go. thoughts, but I don't yeah. think it ever would have happened. I don't think the governor would have gotten on board. I don't think the, that Congress would have gotten on board. Never would have happened. And yet, in hindsight, there were many smart people who told me in the course of making this show that for what we got, it was worth it. But if that's the case, so is the takeaway from that that the, the best transparency is less transparency? I don't, it's complicated. I mean, in some ways, the only way to get this project underway was to kind of drive that first stake and get it in progress before we truly understood what it was going to cost. Do you buy that, Jim Carasiotis? Well, a couple of things. Number, number one is that, that the project had a shelf life of 20 plus years. Um, uh, there were, it was like an open bar at a wedding. Um, uh, there was just a lot of people online who wanted to get taken care of. And, you know, sometimes the bridal party can't afford the open bar. And, and they, you know, they need to tell the bartender to shut it down. And, and, you know, there was... The appetite for public money was insatiable. The, the requests that I would get from businesses for things that, that clearly they didn't deserve, Mass General Hospital, the Spalding Rehab, we had agreed to take their hospital for, for $90 million before I got there. It was worth $37 million. Oh. And so I changed the design of the Charles River Crossing to not take their hospital, and they sued me. Um, and they said that, that this was a conspiracy and so on and so on. But there, there are thousands of stories like this, which he did an unbelievable job because you can't take 20 years of people interacting with each other, people asking for things, and, and try to reduce it to nine episodes um, from someone who was just a kid when yeah. the thing started. But and, is it, isn't it, it did fair an incredible job. I thought he did an incredible job, too. Isn't it fair to say that there were times like when you were speaking to that business group and one of the things, 
I don't want to be unkind, but you Go ahead, sort unkind. of cooked the books a little bit when you're talking to them in terms of that, was it the 7.7 .7 figure, whatever the figure was. Is that unfair? Um, I'll tell you why I think it's not unfair, is that my job was to keep the beach ball underwater, keep the costs down mm -hmm. as, as far as I could. If I gave them, you know, a million, they would ask for 10. If I just, you know, I gave them a billion three, and they were back in 12 weeks looking for another. Was it really 12 weeks? Literally 12 weeks That's from October incredible. to January. You know, it was, it was amazing. Well, I, you know, it seems to me one of the original selling points is that this is going to be mostly federal funded. I think 90% right. federal funding. Tip O'Neill was then running the House yes, and all indeed. that. Ted Kennedy was a senator. But I, I also remember you talk about, um, uh, you know, that everybody wanting a piece of the action. I remember a quote from Joe Malone, who used to be the uh, state treasurer, saying it was like a big, huge champagne glass. You know, mm. one of those that is narrow and then opens up into this big bath. Everybody wanted to jump in mm. and get their piece of the action. Then we'd have stories. I mean, the media was very yep. tough. I remember the, one of the stories I read, I make it the... It's her favorite they, story. It's where the, where the dirt came from, but it was about Quincy, hauling dirt from, from Boston to Quincy, and then the same dirt, they'd haul it back from Quincy <laughs> to Boston or something, all this traveling dirt with building up the idea that there was all this waste. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, dozens and dozens and dozens of, of contractors got to buy houses and send their kids to college and and it was a big job creation program right here in the Commonwealth. You talk about dirt, just another one of those hundreds and thousands of issues is that, that when the dirt went from here to Quincy to fill a landfill in Quincy that they build a golf course on top of, <laughs> um, we had to pay the city of Quincy to take our dirt. We're solving a problem for them and we paid them to take our dirt. So mm -hmm. th that's, you know, you ask how the cost becomes what it becomes and the rules of the game are such that, that you have government agencies everywhere telling you, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, and, and that's how the project grows. Were people terrified of you? Um, Were people who man? worked for you? I'm serious, by the way. I don't mean this in, a, in an attacking kind well, of way. Were they know, terrified of you? I, I'm having lunch today with a few people that I used to work with, yeah. and you know, we get together kind of like once a year and have yeah. you know, a couple of laps, and, and that person after last year reminded me of a story that he came to me as a youngster and, and basically told me I was wrong. And you know, he was working in a cube. Uh. And basically, I brought him up front, put him in an office right next to me because he told me what I needed to hear. And so if anybody didn't have the courage to tell me what they think I needed to hear, I really had no use for them. Got it. So Ian, before we get to what the takeaways are, both yeah. from a guy who ran the project for a decade and the guy who did this brilliant, brilliant podcast. Can you spend a minute, we talk about all the major players, from the Salvucci's to the yeah. Caraciotas to the governors to whatever. Frank Martinez, mm. I love this little personal thing. There are two things, tell them quickly. One, about his kids yeah. and his wife and what she did with the kids. Yep. And two, about wearing big dig paraphernalia uh, around. Can you share both of these with us quickly? Yeah, so Frank Martinez was a foreman on the Atlantic Ave contract. Yeah. It was the first big contract downtown, if you can picture right in front of South Station, basically, is where he was working underground. He spent nine years on that contract. And he, what he said is that he would go to work before the sun came up, you know, his kids would still be sleeping, and he'd come home and the sun would be set and his kids would already be sleeping again. And that was his day. Um, that's how hard they're working, you know, to keep this project on so track. So his wife would bring the kids to visit him exactly. at work yep. so he'd get to see his children. Yeah, so he told me you know, some days they would come and, and just have lunch at South Station. I, I don't know if you it. can picture that little food court where there's like a McDonald's and a Chinese restaurant. That's when he saw his kids for their, basically their whole childhood. And by the way, and, and journalists, like, by the way, Charlie Sennett, is, we'll talk to him Monday about this when we're talking yeah, about he was very the involved. Middle East as a key player when he was at the Globe and all the other people you've mentioned. And the other thing was he said he didn't even want to wear big dig embossed paraphernalia or shirts yeah. because people were so angry about yeah. the cost overruns and all that sort of stuff, even though he's obviously really proud of the work he was doing, right? Yeah, he said, I mean, he, said he would come above ground and he, he wouldn't want to have the hat on, he wouldn't have, want to have the shirt on because people would literally uh, call him out on the street. Okay, so what, starting with you, since it was your, pro, well, not your project, it was your project, but your podcast is your project, what's your takeaway from having, how long did you spend on this? Um, almost a year and a half. Okay, what's your takeaway after a year and a half? That's not bad, work? actually. That's pretty fast work. <laughs> what do you, what, what do you, what's your takeaway? I mean, what, one of the big ones for me is, so thinking about someone like Frank Martinez, 
is that the, the narrative of a project like this is really important. If we want to build big things, and just setting aside whether the Big Dig was successful, whether or not it's the right project, if we want to build big, ambitious projects in this city and elsewhere, the narrative around it, the public perception, the feelings toward it are really important because I think what that Frank Martinez story captures is just how deep the cynicism mm -hmm. around this project became to the point that it was almost impossible for it to function you know, on a day-to-day -day level. And so that's something I think we all have to be mindful of is that, uh, as Fred Salvucci describes it, the church of hearts and minds. We have to attend, attend to the, the church of hearts and minds. Do you buy that uh, thesis? Um, I, I do, and, and I am concerned about building things in the future. I think that, that if you look at what's there today, um, one could argue, and I would argue, surprisingly, that, that what happened down at the seaport is too much. But you're talking about billions of dollars invested in this city that wouldn't have been invested in the city but for this project. You know, can we do this again? Um, yeah, I think we can, but the closer you get to the public when you're spending money, the harder it gets to spend the money because people see it. And when people can get from point A to point B, when people are not getting killed on the job, when there is not obvious corruption on the job, you know, you go down the list, there's not rats overtaking the city, what are you gonna talk about? Well, let's talk about cost. And so it's not like we were out there marching to the beat of, you know, cost control, cost control, cost control. When we talked to the media, we were being asked about it. And, you know, what we were doing was, you, you asked about the honesty of it, is for every increase in the budget, we were looking to take something off the table. We took Chinatown ramp off the table. We took, you mentioned tiles. You know, there were lots of things that we took off the table. At some point, we ran out of things to take off the table, and that's when the project went up. But could you, uh, just, I'm sorry, you go ahead, Marjorie. Well, I, I was just going to wrap this up with you. Oh, you sure, here. fine. Um, uh, we, of course, are facing a, a crisis with the MBTA, which is not functioning. A week from today, we're going to have uh, Philip Ben, the general manager, mm -hmm. in to talk to him about it. But you end this piece. Mm -hmm. I was close to tears with uh, going at 4.30 in the morning over to, to buy Tufts. Yeah. Tell us what you were doing over there. Yeah, so last December, um, the Green Line extension mm -hmm. finally opened, which beyond being symbolically important as a big, ambitious project, it is um, literally a, you know, an extension of the Big Dig. It was one of those transit projects that was called for as part of the original permitting. It only took 30 years. It only took 30 fabulous, years. Yeah. So I decided to go out and ride that first train. I live a walk from the last station, so I got up at 4, 4.30. It was cold. Mm. There's snow on the ground got to the station, and it, w it was amazing. You know, for all the, the issues the Green Line extension has had since, that morning was wonderful to get on a train well, packed with people and ride it downtown. But you talk about hearts and minds, of yeah. course. The problem with that wonderful scene that had me listen to the people cheering is, is yep. that we now know that they screwed up the Green Line extension. Yep. The, tr the tracks yep. are too narrow. So the faith that you have in the MPTA the next big project we have to face, yeah. or Cape Cod Bridges, somebody was talking about that too. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. And it's interesting that that last episode of the podcast came out about a week after all this news about the Green Line extension broke. And I, right up until the day it dropped, I was kind of thinking, oh, should I go back in and like put in a note? Should I put in a caveat? Should I change something to kind of acknowledge the fact that the Green Line extension has these problems? And what I, I decided not to and yeah. leave it because I think what I, try, what I wanted to do with the story of the Big Dig was give it that distance. You know, we now have the distance from the Big Dig to see the full arc, to see the flaws and see the fruits of it. And, you know, someday the history of the Green Line extension will be written and maybe that track gauge thing will be a blip and maybe it'll be a fundamental flaw that, you know, troubles it for years and years. And we just don't know, I think, the full long story of it yet. So I decided to just... Okay. Let that story play itself out. Okay. I tell you, Ian, you're much more grown up than me and Marjorie. It's pretty <laughs> obvious. Jim Carasiotis, it's great to see you. It's Thank been you. a really long Thank time, you. and you were great in this uh, piece of Ian's. And Ian, 
Really, congratulations. Every well, episode Folks like Jim made my job easy and delightful. I, I think every, so. uh, every obscenity I, I let out in six hours of tape <laughs> came, made it to the podcast. It did. Well, it did. I like that about you, actually. To tell it, you the truth. It's a great podcast about the big dig, and it's a great podcast about politics in Massachusetts yeah, and great. all the colorful yeah. characters great. that um, we've all, um, some of us have known you know, for a very long time. Anyway, thank you so much thank for you coming both. in. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. We've been speaking with Ian Cost, lead producer and host of the Big Dig podcast. Podcast, and Jim, Jim Carasiotis, the manager of the Big Dig project in the 1990s. The Big Dig just dropped its final episode. But the whole podcast is available on all major podcast platforms, and you're going to love it. It is really a great listen.